Amen. Amen. You can be seated. God bless you for being here tonight. Amen. It's a uh, few people not here that promised me they would be, but God knew that too, didn't he? Anyway, we got Brother Paul Deem and his lovely wife with us today, and at one time I never thought that I'd see Miss Debbie standing up, much less being out to be able to come out here. Amen. Amen. A lot of prayers went up for her. Right. I told somebody, I said, since I had my heart attack, or since I had open heart surgery, I can cry over about anything real quick. And I can get mad quicker than I can cry sometimes. <laughs> Amen. I just changed my whole outlook on everything, I guess, her whole being. But I wept over that woman over there. I prayed for and wept over her, amen. I've been praying over this woman right here. We've, I couldn't hardly talk about her last night without wanting to cry, amen. But I want, I want you to know that God loves you. Amen. Hey. Bless you, John. He'll go through the valleys. He'll go through on the mountaintops. And I know today, I know today from the bottom of my heart there's going to be a lot of people when they hear what happened here today is going to wish they'd been here. But that's them missing it. Amen. So I'm going to ask Miss Debbie to come and give a testimony and, and uh, sing a song for us. All right? Amen. Well, first of all, I always have a testimony everywhere that I go because I am truly an answer to prayer, and I'm called the Miracle Lady, and most of you have heard my testimony. And um, I was bed fast for a year and a half. Hospice came in. I was, my body was completely shutting down. I was told that I would not live by July the 4th of 2015. I had a frozen shoulder for eight years in arm, and the doctor at Ohio State University told me that I would never be able to use my right hand, arm, and shoulder again. And I say, this is what God can do. Amen. God answers prayer, right. and even my family doctor and my um, neurologist, which the muscle disease that I had, said that there's no medical explanation why I recovered that it was just God. Amen. And I've kind of changed the song. I've wrote a couple songs here that God has given me because when I first, I'm learning to play the guitar, and when I started, I would flip the picks all over the living room floor, and I'm just thankful that I can hold it between my fingers. And I was going to play Where, Where Does Revival Start, but the Lord changed it on me and wanted me to sing, God Makes All Things Possible. Because I wrote the song, and God makes all things possible in our life. And when we go through things we don't understand, God has a plan. But God answers prayer. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for praying for me. Because God answers prayer. So here it goes as I try to play this song, and it's called, God Makes All Things Possible.
course I wanted to sing when I was dying. When the family thought I was in a coma and they thought I was dying. And they all started, had a circle of prayer around me. And I woke up and started praying and I wanted to sing this song. And I, I just, I'm just learning it, so here it goes. But this is what I... Some glad morning when it's life is all few years ago. Brother Paul has direct line ministries. He ships scriptures all over the world. And he came to me about getting some scriptures printed and we, we started printing a lot of his scriptures. And uh, we got 60,000 sitting down there on the floor right now uh, to go out. But he's become a friend. He's now working with me at Gleaning for Christ helping me there too. And uh, I just appreciate him and his stand for the Lord. I appreciate his wife. Amen. I want him to come just a little while and talk just a little bit. He moved his operation to Georgia. Kind of get away from me now, I think, trying to. But anyway, uh, Brother Paul, you come. Thank you, Brother John. It's a blessing and a joy to be here with you. I am so blessed. Um, when I look back and see what the Lord's done for us, Amen. my wife couldn't have been any closer to uh, death. I mean, she had all the signs, everything was done except digging the grave. And you know, it, I still, I'll never get over it. And she had a frozen shoulder on top of all that for about seven, eight years. And she could not move her arm. When God started healing her body, he healed that right arm and you'd never know it today. We serve a wonderful God. Amen. And don't ever underestimate what he can do. You know, we read uh, in the Bible and we see the miracles that God's performed. And, you know, we're serving the same God today. Right. And He can do as He pleases. 
Isn't it wonderful to be in His family and to be His child? And whenever we go to prayer, we talk to, that, talk to the Creator of this universe. God's been so good to us. Uh, Brother John asked me to uh, share about the ministry. My wife and I, we've been in the ministry for, well, we started in 86. We've been married 39 years. And the uh, Lord has, has been so good. We've, uh, we was in missionaries in the Philippines and was in Mexico. But because of health uh, uh, things that was going on that she had, the reason we had to come back to the States. And, you know, he asked me to share some from the God's Word, and too. And I want to kind of incorporate it into the messages. When God interrupts your plans, just trust Him. You know, life is filled with changes sometimes. There's things that we go through and we don't always understand. It could be a job. It could be um, health. It could be a whole number of reasons. But we just have to trust Him. And you know, that's so wonderful about being, in the, being um, a, a, a Christian and being in the center of God's will. We don't have to worry. We just need to trust Him. And... Um, but the uh, Lord brought us back, uh, back to the States, and so in 1999, the Lord let us start direct line ministry. And it has grown over the years, and we was uh, working out of Coolville, Ohio. And uh, we'd been, after the Lord had healed my wife, and uh, we'd been praying about relocating the ministry closer to a seaport, because we're shipping over 30 countries now around the world. Uh, and uh, we have a, or had a 32-foot... 3,200 uh, feet warehouse in Coolville. And uh, we'd been praying about getting a much bigger building. And uh, Lord, uh, I mean, he, miraculously, how he put everything together. And uh, led us to uh, Statesboro, Georgia, where we're located now. And uh, was able to purchase a warehouse for uh, a 38,000 square feet Amen. warehouse. We can get 20 tractor and trailer loads of scriptures and other things in the warehouse. It's so big. In fact, I can drive around in it. And uh, we've got some office space. In fact, Debbie takes care of the office for me. And um, before we came uh, up this past Monday, we shipped our first 40 foot container from Statesboro to Honduras. Uh, thousands of, of scriptures that we sent. And. Uh, I think it was 57,000 uh, New Testaments and thousands of, of uh, Scripture booklets. When we get back, we're working on another 40-foot container for Guatemala. And uh, we've got over 300,000 Scripture booklets. And I appreciate Brother John so much in the printing ministry here. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons, besides the camp meeting, that we came up. Uh, we have uh, about six or seven different churches that assemble scripture booklets for us that we're picking up and taking back down to Georgia with us. We're working on another container for uh, uh, Liberia, West Africa, for missionaries. And then on top of that, we're working uh, on another one. In fact, we're lacking four pallets of scriptures to be able to send to... Uh, uh, Uganda, is that right? Uruguay, I'm sorry, Uruguay, over in South, down South America, and um, we've got several missionaries that's waiting on it. They can use Spanish, uh, Portuguese, English, and even Arabic. And so, Lord has just blessed in tremendous ways and opened up the doors. And you know, it takes God's word to change lives. You know, and as Christians, we're just to sow the seed. God works on the heart. And if you will, take your Bibles and open up with me, if you would, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And just reading a few verses here. Verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting in a net, or casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Father, we thank you for Brother John and 
Father, for the printing ministry. We thank you, Lord, for this camp meeting. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless in a tremendous way today and throughout the week. And may you be glorified. And Father, may there be souls saved. And may Christians be encouraged. And Father, we just thank you for giving us your precious word. And Lord, thank you for all the prayers in which you've heard and you've answered. We love you, Lord. Bless now. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here we have Jesus walking by the sea. And, uh, and he sees uh, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. No doubt these young men had a plan for their lives. They was possibly thinking, you know, someday that I'm going to have a, a big company, big fishing company, and we're going to uh, go into business, and it's going to grow, and so forth, and, and uh, possibly thinking about someday they're going to get married and, and have a children until Jesus came by. And Jesus had a greater plan. Amen. In our lives, if we are, as Christians are sensitive to the leading of God and his, uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit, He's got a plan for all of us. Amen. We don't always understand. You know, whenever my wife started having health problems, and most of the 39 years that we've been married, she's had health problems. It's the reason we had to leave the Philippines. And she's as good a health today as what she was when we went to the Philippines back in 86. I always serve a wonderful God. But Lord had it all planned out. Lord allowed me to be in the Philippines. He allowed us to be in Mexico. To be able to be around other missionaries and see what it's like and see the need. And then back in 1999, after bringing us back off the field, I didn't know what God was doing. I was discouraged. God had changed my plan. My heart was in missions and always has been and always will be. But my vision, my plans was staying on the field somewhere. God had another plan for us. So he brought us back and started changing our directions. I often thought if I was still down in Mexico, we'd be out working in the ranchos and we'd be working and uh, reaching a few thousand people. But today it's literally millions of souls around the world. Amen. But it's not just us. It's everyone working together to make it happen. You see, we're just instruments. And the Lord just looking for someone to use to be an instrument. Amen. You know, it's just like an ink pen or anything else. God just wants to pick us up and use us for His glory and for His praise, not for us. Amen. You know, eternity is what matters in this. You know, think about it. Where, what, what's going to matter to you a hundred years from today? It's not going to be where we lived, the job that we had. It's going to be, what in the world did I do for my Lord and Savior while I had the time to do it? Amen. You know, we've got a life to live and we only go through it one time. We can waste it if we're not careful. And Christians, let's not waste it. You know, we see Christians and uh, churches, uh, people come in Sunday after Sunday and go out. What kind of a change are we making in the world, in the community, in the area around it? You know, it takes God's Word to change lives. We can't. I'm so thankful for all the gospel, all the materials that Brother John and others has printed that's gone around the world and my the souls that's been saved as a result of it. Christmas time, we do the Christmas Joy gift bags. Last year, I think we had over 8,000. And the scripture booklets goes in those. I get back uh, um, from missionary stories and people getting saved and they use them and going into a new area to start a church. It's hard to tell how many thousands of souls that will be saved as a result of it. Amen. You know, it's so easy to get off track, Christians. When we're going through a rough time and a hard time in our life, it's so easy to get off track. Amen. You know, whenever my wife was having some health problems, I worked at DuPont for about 10 years outside of Parkersburg. I was an instrument mechanic before the Lord called me into missions. When we came back from, um, I think it was the Philippines, I was discouraged. I did not know what God was doing. And I had an opportunity to go back to work, not for DuPont, but for another company doing the same amount of work. And I thought, boy, you know, that'd be great. I had health coverage. I had everything I needed and, and take care of my family. But down deep, I didn't have a piece about it. You know, when we get ready to make those decisions, we need to make sure God's in it. Amen. And I'm, I've often thought, I am so glad, so thankful 
that I didn't make the wrong decision. Right. You see, what else really matters in life, Christians? We can waste our life if we're not careful. Amen. I am so thankful for the Lord. Sometimes He interrupts our plans. It may be a vacation. It may be whatever. To get us to do what He wants us to do. Right. It is so easy for us to get our eyes off of Him. You know, whenever my wife was uh, dying, and, and she had every symptom. Hospice said just call in the family. She's not going to be around by July the, July the 4th, 2015. I mean... Her body was getting cold. She had the death rattle. For those of you that knows what the death rattle is. She had everything done. She had a funeral plan. She gave away her jewelry to our children and, and grandchildren. Everything was planned. I was kind of like a zombie. I'd go out and I was just numb. Because I was about to lose my dear wife, who I dearly love, the Lord gave me. She got a glimpse of heaven one evening. And you could feel the presence of God. I've never been so a situation like that before. And she prayed and asked God for more time. And God started reversing everything. They like to have blown hospice's minds. They didn't understand it. And God started giving her muscles back. All of her muscles deteriorated. She couldn't swallow. Her muscles in her throat, she couldn't swallow. She had been, um, for about seven weeks, she couldn't eat no food and very little liquids. I had to crush her medicine up and put it in her tongue, under her tongue to get her to take her medicine. But God reached down and touched her body. She's been going out and God's been using that for her to speak to ladies groups in different, different kind of areas. And she has to take some pictures with her because otherwise people would not believe the condition she was in. You know, yeah, it's a rough, it was a rough thing to go through. But God allowed it for us to be able to reach more people for Him and to encourage others. So sometimes, Christians, God will allow things in our lives and sometimes God will interrupt our plans to put us where He wants us, not where we want to be. And we just have to trust Him. You know, I love doing what we're doing. I love where God has called us. And our children uh, lives down in Georgia. In fact, we've got 14 grandchildren now and another one on the way. And uh, my wife and I was able to be there when our 14th grandchild was born. But we're only an hour from the seaport. And it was just miraculous how the Lord provided. We knew the Lord wanted us to move down to Georgia. We didn't understand it, everything. We needed a bigger warehouse, I knew. And so the Lord sent someone to buy our house. We put it on a market for, uh, I think, about 10 days or two weeks. And we had three offers on it. And so we knew the Lord wanted us to, uh, to move, and we thought, I thought, boy, you know, what are we going to do about our warehouse and uh, the office? And the Lord sent someone. We didn't even advertise it. He said, I want it just as it is. My wife was thinking about all the work that needed to be done, and the Lord sent someone to buy it. In fact, he wanted us out by the end of December, and I said, no way, <laughs> because we had the warehouse, and it was packed. We didn't know where the Lord wanted us, but other, other than Georgia. And so within, two, within less than two months, the Lord showed us where He wanted us. He gave us a warehouse over ten times the size that we have back here in Ohio. And I was just thinking before I came up, we had close to a, a million scriptures in the warehouse. Thousands and thousands of complete Bibles that's going around the world. Is it us? No. It's because of like Brother John and you all and those churches that support us, Pastor Hoffman. And you all that makes it happen. But you know, Christians, let me say this for a closing. 
every one of us is important to God. And if we make the wrong decision in our lives when God wants us to do something and we don't follow through on it, do you realize the damage it could cause? Amen. And do you realize the souls may never hear the gospel because we failed to do what God called us to do? Amen. God is looking for faithfulness. He wants us to just keep at it. Yes, we're going to have problems. There's going to be things that's going to happen in our lives. But you know, I'd rather be serving Him and be in the center of His will than be the richest man on the face of the earth. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. And one day, we're all going to be to heaven. Amen. And we'll be able to rejoice over what God's done. I, I appreciate Brother John and and the ministry here, and like I mentioned, we've become good friends, and I often tease him when I call him. I know when he's feeling good and when he's not feeling too good health-wise. And uh, I appreciate him so much. Appreciate all the scriptures. Only eternity will reveal all the souls that will be saved. Amen. But I believe the more seed that we sow, the greater harvest we're going to have. Right. And if we don't sow any seed, we're not going to have any harvest. Right. So let's just keep sowing seed around the world. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your precious, precious word that you've given to us to live by, Lord, and to follow. Thank you the Holy, for the Holy Spirit that you've put within us to give us direction. Father, we thank you for being in control. We love you. Bless now, Father, in the service. May you be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Miracle lady over there. Amen. Amen. Bless you, yeah. It happens. I was standing beside a woman's bed one night, and they told me at, at Charles Memorial Hospital said this lady is the sickest lady here in the hospital tonight, and she had. 11 children, they come and walked around her bed and said, Mom, we're praying for you. She's getting ready to go into surgery and she was in a coma. And all of them said, Mom, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. And I was standing over on the other side of her, the bed, and the last one went out and the nurse was falling them out. I said, it's the preacher I'd like to pray for you. And her eyes popped open. Amen. And the nurse hollered, She's all right. She's all right. And everybody come back in and prayed with her family did. God knows. Amen. God knows. All right. We're going to stand, Brother Roy. <coughs> I didn't have this on the plan. But we got to always take up an offering, right? Huh? <coughs> Excuse me. And they need to stand up. Because this group's going to sing. They can come and start getting ready to sing. Amen. But we, hey, uh, Jeremy, get that hat out of my out of my truck out there. You got baskets under your desk down there, too. Uh. Oh, okay. <coughs> I was afraid it was going to be like last night. I was going to get my hat, pass the hat. Amen. <laughs> Baptist is bigger than a hat. All right. Uh, here. Thank you. All right. All right. You, uh, Brother Roy, would you pray, please? My gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you again this day. Father, we come to you with an ever thankful heart. Thank you for Brother Paul, his wife, and Lord, the work that they do. And we appreciate them as a missionary. The souls has been going to you because of the work they've done. Father, we thank you for the folks that have come out this evening. We pray that you bless this offering, bless it 
uh, to your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. Today. We aren't here to put on a show, which you'll find out real quickly. Um, we always feel like our job is to prepare you to be ready to hear from God's Word, and so that's what we're here to do. If you have a testimony, if you have a shout, please feel free to give it, and um, we hope we can be a blessing to you.
Number 10. I love sound, man. I just really do. But anyway, Hosea chapter number 10. I feel like you're following me. Well, the red, the blue lights on. I mean, that's up to you. All right. Hosea chapter number 10. It's good to be here uh, this afternoon, and I appreciate the singing. I just want to say thank you to Bert for letting the girls sing with you tonight today. I appreciate that. And uh you think they sound good, you ought to hear them with his mic off. But anyway, Hosea chapter number 10. And when his voice changes, there'll really be something. Hosea chapter number 10. I'm just kidding. But I'm excited to be with you today and throughout the week this week. And uh, been looking forward to it. When I started off in the ministry, we had a tent. And we'd travel around and set that tent up different places. And some of you were under the tent with us. And my wife and I were talking the other day. She said, why do we ever quit doing that? And now when I get back to the house, I'll, I'll be able to remind her. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's in balmy 83 degrees out here. What are we? But anyway, there's this amazing thing called air conditioning. Amen. But anyway, all right, looking forward to what Thor's going to do this week, though, and praying that God will meet with us. And I know this. I know that God wants to. And I believe that, the, uh, that uh, if we'll just get His way and let God work, that uh, we'll be happy at the end of the week. We'll leave this place saying it was good to be uh, in the meeting. And I've enjoyed it so far. Hosea chapter number 10. We'll read one verse of Scripture, verse number 12. And I'm going to give you just a short abridged uh, thought this afternoon. I won't keep you long. But I want to help us just maybe get in the right frame, the right place, so that we can uh, just have a meeting this week. All right, so come back tomorrow night throughout the week, Friday, all the way through Friday, 7 o'clock each evening, and we'll be seeing, looking forward to seeing what the Lord is going to do. Hosea chapter number 10, verse 12, the Bible said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. Now, I want you to notice in the verse, the very fact that this verse is in the Bible tells us that God was able to revive His children. God wanted to. In fact, I see it as God standing there saying, Well, I'd like to bless you. I'd like to restore you. I'd like to meet the need that you have. But it was contingent upon the action of the people of God. He said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, and then you'd reap in mercy. And here's the key. It's a very familiar revival verse. He said, Break up your fallow ground. God is saying, Yes, I can revive. Yes, I can restore. But first you've got to prepare your heart to receive that reviving. Amen. In fact, it'd just be a waste of time. It'd be futile. It'd be vanity of vanities for God to pour out upon His children what He desired to if their heart wasn't ready to receive it. I believe God can still send revival. Amen. And I believe God wants to send revival. Amen. But I think God is looking for a group of people that will prepare themselves to receive it. Amen. For just a little while this, this afternoon, I just want us to think on this thought of people ready for revival. And let's ask God to prepare our heart today so that the rest of the week is just good. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this afternoon. Thank you for the truth we've already heard and for the songs that we've heard, the testimonies that we've heard. And I pray now you'd help us as a people here assembled under this tabernacle to prepare our hearts, God, that you might have right away to move the way you want to move this week. 
Thank you for uh, uh, Brother John. Thank you for everybody who's put together this meeting. I pray that you bless the efforts in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe revival might be one of the most misused words in the Christian vocabulary. It seems like we're living in an hour where people tag every meeting with the title of revival. In fact, I see the word all over the place. I drive the country and I'll see it on different church signs. It'll say such and such date to such and such date, revival. But I wonder how often does the revival make it from the church sign into the hearts and lives of the people in the church house? Often they'll say, well, that was good preaching. We had revival. I've had them say, that song stirred my heart. I've been revived. I've even heard people say, I came to church sad, but I'm leaving happy. I think I've had revival. Many times people will tell me, we need revival. I've had folks come up and say, I need revival. People often say, America needs revival. But I'm getting to wonder if we mean revival in the same way God means revival. I wonder if we honestly want a Bible revival or just our own modern version of what we think revival ought to be. I was preaching in a state down south. I won't name the state to protect the guilty, but it was Georgia. But anyway, I was preaching down south and I was getting my hair cut. And I was the only one in the barber shop in a shirt and tie. Now, I don't always wear a shirt and tie. I don't hunt in a shirt and tie, and I don't shower in one. But I was wearing a shirt and tie that day at the barber shop. And everybody was looking at me like I wasn't from around there, and that's kind of the way I like it anyway. And finally, a fellow said, what are you doing in town? And I said, I'm holding a revival meeting of such and such independent, fundamental, premillennial, temperamental Baptist church. That's what I'm doing in town. And he said, oh, good, we're having a revival meeting at our church. And he named some non-denominational uh, worship center kind of a church. And I said, well, good. He said, God's really moving. I said, well, I'm glad. My meeting stinks. I'm glad God's moving somewhere. Uh, but anyway, we talked about revival a little bit. And he talked about how God was blessing and God was moving. And we talked about it for a minute or two. And got our hair cut and began to walk out. He's wearing overalls just like everybody else was except for me in the barber shop. And as we walked through the door, he began to tell me how God was moving. God was blessing. God was speaking to his heart. And simultaneously reached in the top pocket of his overalls, poured out his cigarettes. Packed them down real tight, popped out a cigarette, lit it up, took a draw, uh, a drag on that thing, and, and blew the smoke in my face. Said, I'll be praying for your meeting. God sure is blessing at our place. We're having revival. Now, that ain't the kind of revival I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the kind of revival that doesn't change you. I'm not talking about the kind of revival that can't free us from the sin that does so easily beset us. I don't mean the kind of revival where we leave the same way that we came in. Here's what I'm afraid. I think most people want to be blessed, but they don't want to be revived. They want the goodness of God, but not the reviving of God. We want the crown, but don't want the cross. We want the garland, but not the sackcloth and ashes. We want the birth, but don't want the labor that it takes to deliver the baby. Charles Finney said this, Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. is giving up one's will to God in deep humility. Now, I believe that we need revival. In fact, I know we need revival. I don't even have to take a vote on it. I believe I need revival. I believe my family needs revival. I believe our churches need revival. But I'm not talking about just a temporal pep rally for Jesus kind of revival. I'm not talking about just coming to church and having the hair on the back of your neck stand on end. I'm not talking about just saying amen, running laps, and swinging from chandelier. Ears. But I'm talking about an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, spirit-filled, life-altering Bible revival. That's what I believe we need. I mean the kind of revival where the mind of Christ dwells within you again. Where the heartbeat of God beats in your breast. Where the Holy Spirit is not just the resident of your life, but He's the president of your life. I'm talking about a man made different by the power of God. A mother whose life has changed. A young person who catches fire. A church who's resurrected from the apathy that has found itself in and goes out to turn its city upside down for the glory of God. I believe we can still see that kind of revival. In fact, if I didn't, I would not be outside in 80 degree weather in a dress shirt. Say amen right there. I believe that God can still send revival. Our God is the same that He's ever been. He's Hezekiah's God and Jonah's God and Peter's God and so on and so forth. And He can do today what He's ever done. And we ought not be satisfied with anything less than what we read about God doing in the pages of the Word of God. But here's what I'm saying. Revival doesn't just happen because we're under a tabernacle. Revival doesn't just happen because you post it on Facebook. Revival is more than a hashtag. 
Pardon me while I preach a minute. Uh, revival is more than just coming to church sad and leaving happy. You can't promote it down or pay it down. We could have a rock altar, set up a tabernacle, erect a tent and meet every day of the week. I mean for a year straight. We could have the best singing, the best looking preacher. We've got, we've got half of that equation this week. I mean we could have all those things. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have revival. If God is going to move the way God desires to move, you and I have to be willing to clear the path, remove the debris, break up our fallow ground and ready ourselves to receive revival. I, I love the prophet Hosea. He was the prophet in the northern kingdom. He prophesied during the reign of King Jeroboam. Now I've got an old Schofield Bible. It's just what I started with. and I've, I, I still got the same wife. I figured I'll keep the same Bible. But anyway, if you have an old Schofield Bible, he describes Hosea's preaching with one word. And I like the word. If I was ever going to have a resume, I'd want that word on my resume. Here it is. Abrupt. That means he's in their grill. All right. That means he took the gloves off. That means he didn't wet his finger to the wind and ask permission from his wife to preach. That means he just said, well, thus saith the Lord. And you know what happened? They messed around and had revival. Now, I'm not the deepest theologian here today, but I reckon if it took that kind of preaching to have revival then, it's going to take that kind of preaching to have revival today. Mark it down. Brother Joyce and Sister Joel preaching never has and never will bring revival. If we're going to have revival, it's going to take some old-fashioned Hosea kind of preaching. Now, if you read the book of Hosea, and some of y'all just found out there is a book called Hosea today. But if you ever read the book of Hosea, you'll find out there's a theme